title of the message today is The Bible and Women Rulers. The Bible uh -huh. and Women Rulers. Now, some years ago, I had a discussion with a fellow about church attendance. Now, he expressed his belief that he had, had God known that someday there would be such a thing as television, why he never would have required us to attend church. Um, I assured him that God was completely aware of the eternity or the entirety of the part and that uh, of the past, the present, and of the future to come. I told him, I said, you know, God knew all about television, right? How many of you believe that? <laughs> but you see, there's a mindset out there of people uh, who who just are, are totally biblically illiterate. They have just cannot uh, seem to grasp reality. And those of us that are biblically literate, we laugh at such foolish laughter. But let us not forget that the vast majority of the world's population today are still totally ignorant when it yep, comes to they are. Really. God's work. That's right. And now I don't know if this fellow was, was just uh, putting me on or if he really believed that. But I remember a woman who, a Catholic woman that used to volunteer in a ministry. And uh, she was telling me that we need to worship Mary because if Mary had decided not to uh, to give birth to Jesus, uh, if Mary had not been pro-life, then uh, we would all be lost. Huh. Well, you know, huh? I don't see anywhere in the Bible where uh, she was given a choice, right? Yeah. Yeah. God says, you have been chosen. That's the end of that conversation, right? Yeah. And believe me, uh, she was more excited about that. That was the the dream of every Hebrew woman to be the one who would be the mother of Messiah. I mean, Amen. Uh, a blessed of amongst women mm -hmm. uh, to this very day. Mary is still the most blessed amongst women. Amen. Amen. And so, as I preach this message uh, this entire week, I'm going to incur the anger of a rebellious female population. Uh, go for it. People like Go Elizabeth Warren, right. Hillary Clinton, and it looks like Megyn Kelly's going that way too. Oh yeah. By the way, folks, can you believe that Elizabeth Warren, Hillary Clinton, and I, yours truly, have found something that we can all agree on? I heard, when I heard Elizabeth Warren with Hillary at her side warned Donald Trump not to mess with us nasty women. I totally agree that they are nasty women. In fact, I, I thought I could even add some other words, like old nasty women, or mean nasty women, uh, but I just uh, just decided to go with very, the word very nasty women. Anyhow, so let's go back to what the Bible teaches. First, what we have to do is look at the reality of God's Word. Again, to a lot of people, uh, God's Word uh, is just not relevant for today. Remember what Obama said? That uh, he referred to Romans 1 as irrelevant. Uh, he re referred to uh, the Old Testament as archaic and out of date. I didn't think God ever went out of date. Oh, there, there. There. And so, you turn to Psalm chapter 12. Let's take a look at what the Word of God says about itself in Psalm chapter 12, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases from the faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity, every one with his neighbor. With flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off all the flattering lips and the tongue that speak of proud things. Who have said, with our tongue will we prevail? Our lips are our own. Who is... Lord over us. And that's that's what you have a lot. In fact, there's an article that Sandy brought in today, written by a fool. The fool wrote an article in the paper uh, talking about why we don't need God's word and that it's it's the Bible and and, the, and Christianity that's that has caused all the discrimination against women. Huh. And, uh, so. This person is a fool. Mm -hmm. Yep. For the oppression of the poor, for the sighting of the needy, now will I rise with the Lord. 
I will sit in his safety for whom the puppet thumb. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. I guess that answers that question, doesn't it? Yeah. Hallelujah. Are God's words still relevant for today? Amen. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. Mm, yeah. And boy, have we seen that, haven't we? Yes. And no place is that clearer than what we have in the White House today. Uh -huh. When the vilest men, and we see the wicked on every side today. And then I want you to go over to Psalm 119. And about Psalm 119, what God's Word, the Bible has to say about itself, uh, in verse 89, Psalm 119, verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Let me say that again. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. You see, for those of us that have been to court many times and had to be charged with about everything you can imagine, one of the terms you're always hearing the opposition use is settled law, settled law. They keep saying that, okay? And uh, they, they pulled that too with Judge Roy Moore as they kept uh, saying, making that statement that uh, the Supreme Court is the law of the land, a settled law. And Judge Roy Moore kept saying, show me that in the Constitution. Where is that? And they couldn't answer. They just, they just refused to answer. And they would say it again, that the Supreme Court is the law of the land, that's settled law. And Judge Roy Moore, who was extremely articulate, I mean, this guy knows the Constitution inside and outside, backwards and forward. He said, where is that in the Constitution? Well, it's not in the Constitution. Anywhere is it in the Constitution. Okay, but that's, but this is what you hear. Well, what, what you just heard is settled law. I'll tell you what settled law is. When God gave us the divine institution of marriage and a family, that's settled law. Amen. Yep. That's right. He gave us that 6,000 years ago, folks. That's settled law. That means, okay, uh, what they're calling, again, I, I want to repeat it over and over. What they call same-sex marriage, God has already defined and declared to be two things, fornication and an abomination. Right. Okay. That's settled law. Mm -hmm. That is settled law. Yep. That's the rule. Now, you know, see, God has already said, folks, when it's all over, when he's going to win this argument. All the time. He's already won it. They just don't know it yet. Right? And so, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 24, because this fellow named Jesus, he came along, and he reemphasized that. And here's what he said in Matthew 24, and verse 35. Now, in order a parable of the fig, no, verse 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Amen. Now, listen, here, if heaven and earth passes away, but his words stand, guess what? His words are the last thing standing, folks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's what you call settled law. Amen? Amen. Well, so we've seen what God's word, the Bible, has had to say about itself, that his words are as relevant today as they've ever been. Uh, God is on the throne. He hasn't lost an iota of his power. Uh, the world is in for a really, really, really rude awakening. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, we're going to take a look at why women were never meant to be rulers. Amen. I had uh, Wendy Wilson called when she called in on the radio program, and I asked her... Uh, who she would vote for. And she said what she would. She said, well, I can't vote for Hillary. We're not supposed to vote for women. I was amazed to hear that from a woman. <coughs> as rulers. Okay. Now, you say, now, wait a minute. I challenge. I said, Wendy, wait a minute. Uh, didn't, you, didn't you hear me promoting Jan Porter? Okay, I promoted Jan Porter. She's a woman, right? And Hillary says, yeah. Uh, why'd you do that? You see, when you have a situation here where you have, in that case, a righteous woman running against a wicked man, mm. a wicked man. You can't support the wicked, right? right. He tells you in Proverbs chapter 24 that if you do that, you should be cursed. 
the nation yep. should curse you. But most of the women, like Beverly Goldstein and um, that Sharila that I had on the radio program, uh, Taylor, they're voting against unclean women. Amen. They're voting against very, very unclean women. Like, like Hillary uh, says, nasty women. They're voting against, they're running against nasty women. So, now, whose fault is that? Is the men? Men should be stepping up to the plate that they failed. Right. And it all goes back, judgment begins where? In the house of God. It goes back to the pulpit, folks. It goes back to the pulpit. Mm. The reason the country's in the way that it is today it goes back to the pulpit. Somebody just told me this morning, someone was saying that, uh, what is it, something like 90% or more of the pastors in the pulpits are not telling their people to vote against Hillary. That's an amazing. Who said that? Did you tell me that? Okay, somebody was telling me that. Yeah, that was you, John? Okay. Oh, John? Yeah. 98%. 98%. Wow. Failed. You know why? It was because of the 501c3. Mm -hmm. The little fellows were afraid. Cowards. You know, I wish you all would have been with me at, at the UBF conference. I'm going to tell you, every single pastor there were bold. Every man that stood up and Good. preached. Bold men. Good. Bold Proverbs 28 men. 1. Okay, every one of them would be willing to, you would be proud to stand shoulder to shoulder with them. Uh, they would be willing to go to prison and stand on principle. Not one cowardly person there. Not one coward. Good. Boy, do we have that, a real problem with that. But I praise the good Lord for the men that he has raising up because I'm hearing from more and more of them. Today. That's good. Anyhow, this is supposed to be. In Genesis chapter 3, we read, starting with verse 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, did eat, and also gave it to her husband with her. That's a problem right there. Now you see, the problem was, this is where uh, yeah. uh, the Apostle Paul make, makes it very, very clear that that's where the enemy attacks women. In now, Satan, Lucifer, the, he knew that Adam, Adam had the authority uh, to take his head off. He knew that. And that's why he didn't go to Adam. Uh, but Adam made the same mistake that us men do all the time, all yeah, every that's day. True. And we listen to our wives when we should know better. At times when uh, we should know better. And, and just what he did here, he listened to Eve when he knew better, because God had told him not to eat of that tree. He knew better, but right. because of his love for her, he listened to her over yeah. God. And the eyes of them were both open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Folks, oh, guess what? God could see them. <laughs> he could see them, right? And, and the Lord called, called Adam and said, Where art thou? And he said, Well, I, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Well, who told thee that thou were naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, wherefore I commanded thee that thou shouldest not? You see, the Lord knew that he had eaten of that tree. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta tell you this, see, because a lot of people don't know this. God is a whole lot smarter than we are. Yeah. <laughs> yes. and, and we are never fooling him. We're never fooling him. And the man said, The woman that thou gavest to be with me, why, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Well, he's he telling the truth, right? Okay. First man guy. But you see, see how quick he tried to pass that blame. Yep. He wasn't passing the blame to Eve. Do you understand? He was passing the trying to pass the blame to God. Yep. You gave me that woman, God. Yep. You did it. <laughs> right? Had yep. you, if you hadn't given me that woman, I'd be okay. But now you gave me that woman. Oh. Right. Uh, and the yep. Lord God said unto the woman, "What is this that thou hast done?" The devil made me do. And that's exactly what the woman said. Why, well, that serpent, well, he beguiled me, and I did eat. 
Now Adam had told her, don't touch the tree. Don't eat of that tree. Don't right. eat of that fruit. Now she knew better, right? Yeah. And she told she told the serpent, hey, listen, we're not supposed to be touching, you know, eating that fruit at all. Okay. And so so what did she do? Knowing that, she tempted her own husband. That. Right? That is what you call very weak discernment, folks. That is not good discernment. Right. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon the belly shalt thou go, and the dust that thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. Now, the, the one thing that I was very disappointed with when I went to uh, <coughs> the ark and, and to the uh, museum that they have there uh, in Kentucky, go see that. And that is, I mean, they had a lot on the Garden of Eden. I mean, they had a lot. I mean, you, you ought to really go see it. What an education you'll get at that place. It's tremendous. But anyhow, the only thing that I was disappointed was with, they had, uh, in the Garden of Eden, they had the serpent as a snake coiled around a tree. So was, he, was, he didn't appear as a snake. He appeared as very something very beautiful. And folks, uh, he did not... You know, he walked on two legs until after mm. this point. You see here, right. and the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon the belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat the days of thy life. <clears throat> and I will put enmity between thee and thy woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall be, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Well, and unto the woman, Will I greatly multiply thy sorrow in conception? The sorrow shall thou bring forth children, and that desire shall be to thy husband. He shall rule over thee, yep. and he shall rule over thee. You yep. see, God meant that. See, He meant that. Today, boy, I'm going to tell you, that gets feminists all upset. Oh well. Okay. Right. Right. And you see, again, that's a part of that that rebellious nature, uh, men. Have a rebellious nature against God often. Yeah. And and women against their husbands. Yep. Pew. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is thy ground for thy sake, and sorrow shall thou eat of it all the days of thy life. That means, son, you gotta go to work now. Yeah. Now you're going to have to work for your food. Everything's going to cost you. Uh, the good life's over with. Woo! The good life's over with, right? Man. Thorns also and thistles shall bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field, and the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. So thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. You see! They were made to live forever. They Amen. weren't made to go back to the ground. Amen. But you see, they didn't pay close attention, did they? No. <clears throat> see, folks. And that's still what's happening every day. People living their lives like God's word is not relevant for today. Yep. And then they pay a horrible price for it. Oh. I'm always interested in people that, that don't tithe. And then they wonder why they're always having financial problems. Mm -hmm. They don't, you know, in God's word, the Bible, pretty clear. It couldn't be any clearer on it, right? I remember one couple we had in here that uh, they would always leave just before we took up an offering. Big mistake. I, I can tell you this, they weren't saving money. Nope. They weren't saving money. God's words are relevant. Very, very relevant. And so, turn over to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis 18, verse, starting with verse 9. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah, thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to this time of life, and lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son, and Sarah heard it at the tent door which was behind him. 
Now Sarah does two stupid things right here. Okay. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself. Now I can understand that. I can understand if you're 90 years old and someone tells you you're about to have a baby. Uh, I can understand that. Especially if you're a man. Right? Of course, nowadays, who knows? Right? But anyhow, but, but then she says, after I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being you know, old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I have surety bear a child when I'm old? <clears throat> Is anything too hard for the Lord? At that time appointed I will return, and according to the time of life Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied. Folks, don't lie to the Lord. Don't lie to the Lord. You can't get away with it, right? And that's where she really messed up. That shows very poor discernment, right? Right. And Sarah denied, saying, I, I laughed not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. Okay. And then, turn over to Genesis chapter 16. <coughs> and in Genesis chapter 16, Verses 1 through 16. Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, bear him no children. And she had a, a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid, that it might be that I may obtain children by her. And Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarai. Now Abraham did a stupid thing, you see. God had told him, if you just read the previous chapter, God had told him very clearly, guess what, I'm going to I'm going to make you a great nation out of you, out of your seed, from your... So he knew that. He knew that. God had told him that. But what did he do? Did he listen to God? No. Nope. He was just like Adam. He listened to his wife instead of God. And Sarai, Abraham's wife, took her Hagar, her maid, and the Egyptian after Abraham, and dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband, Abraham, to be his wife. She was wife number two. And Sarai said unto Abraham, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and thee. And Abraham said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand to do as it pleases with her. And Sarai dealt heartily with her, and she fled from her face. Now, she went and gave her to him to be his wife. And now, she's, she's plenty to old Abraham. She's, he's between a rock and a hard spot. Now he's between his two wives. Right? Mm -hmm. And the angel of the Lord found her by the fountain of water in the wilderness by the fountain in the way to Shur. Now you know who the angel of the Lord is. That's the Lord himself. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, whence comest thou, and whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from thy face of my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself under her hand. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. Why did that happen? We call them Muslims today. Yep. Yeah. You see, all of this, all of this, because we had a couple of women, women that uh, didn't listen to God. Nope. And what did they do? No. Nope. Yeah. They brought their husbands in on it. Yeah. And it was their fault because they, they God spoke to the men first. Right. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. 
and he shall dwell in the presence of his brethren. No one kills as many Muslims as Muslims, right? Right. I mean, they're fighting somebody all the time. And he called the name of the Lord and spake unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Wherefore, the well is called Beer La Roy. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bare Abraham a son. And Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bare him, Ishmael. And Abraham was four and six years old. When Hagar bare Ishmael to Abraham. You hear that, Joe and Big Jim? He was 86 when he started his family. Does that give you any hope? All right. All right. Okay. So, turn over to Genesis 19. And in Genesis 19, starting with verse 24. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord of heaven. And he overthrew those cities, all the plain, and all the inhabitants of the cities that which grew upon the ground. And his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain to be held low, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass that when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow, which he overthrew the cities in which Lot dwelt. <coughs> Lot's wife, she didn't want to give up. You know, she was Mrs. Lot. You know, Lot was a Lot was a big deal there. And, and so, uh, he was like the mayor of the city. He was, you know, he sat in the gates. He, uh, and now he was dealing with all these Democrats. For that, and that's what they were in that day. But we call Democrats today. They were Sodomites. And, but his wife didn't listen. You see, there's sometimes you just got to listen to what God's Word, the Bible, is telling you. Right. And, if you're a stiff-necked, rebellious person and you don't want to listen, you say, well, I know what it is I want to believe and I'm going to hold to it. Well, that'll cost you. You're going to pay a price, folks. God always does what he said he'll do. He'll always honor the commitment of his people. He's the only one you can trust. I mean, he's the only one. Amen? Amen. And so now, she looked back. And she, she wanted a part of that, that city, all of that that she was leaving. She was Mrs. Locke. And she, she wanted to stay in the world. So she chose the world over obedience to God, which was very poor discernment. And then the next verse here. And Lot went up out of Zor and dwelt in the mountain with his two daughters with him. For he feared to dwell in Zoar, and he dwelled in a cave, he and his two daughters. And the firstborn said unto the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come unto us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him when many, that we may preserve the seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and perceived not, when she lay down nor when she arose. When it came to pass on the, the morrow, that the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I lay yesterday night with my father, let us make him drunk wine this night also, and go thou in and lie with him, that we may preserve the seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. Now, thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. Now, first of all, why did they have to get him drunk? And it's an amazing thing. Now, remember, this was not incest, because at this time there was no incest. Uh, God had not made that law yet at this time. So it wasn't incest. 
But why did they have to get their father drunk? It's because they knew that he would have no part of that. Right. And that's why they had to do that. Okay? This is very poor to serve. What they should what, what Eve should have done is gone to Adam and say, Hey Adam, you know, this the serpent over here is thinking that we should maybe try some of this fruit here. What do you think? That's what she should have done. She didn't. He should have okay. told her no. Right. And you see that would and Adam probably would answer, Well, we better listen to what God said, right? Exactly. But he didn't. And the same thing. Sarah should have gone to Abram and said, hey, Abram, you know what I'm thinking about doing is giving you Hagar here. And Abraham should have said, well, wait a minute. God done told me that we're going to have children, okay? And right. let's just leave it at that. But she didn't, and he didn't, right? Right. And now these women, they should have gone to their dad and said, hey, dad, look, you know, you're, you're old. And, uh, you know, in, that, in those days, it, uh, people that didn't have any children were believed to be cursed and if a if a woman mm. couldn't conceive anytime they always it was always blamed that, that she was cursed by God and that's why she couldn't conceive you see mm. and so turn it to Genesis 39 and Joseph was brought down to Egypt and Potiphar an officer of Pharaoh captain of the guard an Egyptian bought of him the bought of him the hands of the Israelites, which had brought him down hither. Well, you see, Joseph's brothers had sold him in, trying to get rid of him, sold him in uh, to slavery. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to do prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in the sight of him, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house and all that he had that he put in his hand. And it came to pass from, from that time that he made him overseer in the house over all that he had. And the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, and the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught. He had saved the bread which he did eat, and Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, <coughs> and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my pet master wadeth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that hath into my hand. There is none greater in this house. Then I, neither has he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Uh huh. Sin against who? God. And it came to pass as he spake to Joseph day by day, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie with her or to be with her. And it came to pass. About this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out. And it came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled forth, that she called unto the men of her house and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us. And he came unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. Well, that's a lie. You see, her big mistake was here. What does the Bible say? It says not to touch God's anointed. Yeah. Not to touch God's anointed. Amen. And that was a big mistake. She should have, uh, what Joseph should have probably done is after the second or third time, he should have gone to his master and said, look, I want, I want you to know them. nothing's happened, but I want you to know what's going on here. Okay? Yeah. And then the master would have put her in prison instead of him, probably. Right. And, uh, kind of reminds us of some of those women that are running for office today, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And so, that was very, very, very poor discernment on her part. Now just think of this, what kind of a ruler would she be today? 
Just like some of those that we have out there today. Turn over to 1 Samuel 15. Samuel 15, 22-23. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord a great delight in the burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, to hearken from the fat of rams. For rebellion as is, is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness as iniquity with idolatry, because thou hast rejected the word of the the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Mm. You see, he was telling them, look, they haven't rejected you, they rejected me. Right. They rejected me. Mm. And that's what the people have done today. This feminism is right from the pit of hell. Yep. Right from the pit of hell. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 17. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, Starting in verse 17. Now here it talks about, this uh, is the law of kings and rulers. This is the law that God gives you of kings and rulers. The people that are supposed to, that God has raised up, or God has told us that we are to support as kings and rulers. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away, neither shall he greatly multiply himself silver and gold. Okay. Well, Abraham kind of knew that, I think. And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom. Do you ever notice here he's talking about he, 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 or him? Amen. And he shall write upon a, write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests and the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. That his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, and that he turn not aside for the commandment, to the right hand or to the left, uh, to the end that he may prolong his days in the kingdom, and his children in the midst thereof. Well, He's telling them actually he is to take and write, hand write, okay? Uh, today, <laughs> our younger, our millennials couldn't do that because they can't write cursive, okay? Yeah. But uh, to hand write yeah. the book of the law. Mm. But he makes it very clear that God has raised up men to be kings and rulers. Amen. Turn over to the book of Judges. Now, this is the only female ruler in the entire Bible that God raised up. He raised up one female ruler, and with her, he raised up a man. Uh, she is the only judge, Deborah, and Barak, or Barak, was with her, okay, that God raised up because she was a godly woman. And now if you take a look at uh, all of the Old Testament prophets, all of the, uh, the rulers, the heads of, of all of the tribes were all men. Amen. Uh, all of the apostles were all men. Amen. Okay. Uh, this is the only uh, place uh, that God had raised up uh, this righteous, godly woman, a virtuous woman. By the way, we missed it. Uh, but I heard it was really good there at the UBF conference uh, there in, in Paducah. One of the, for the first time they had a woman speaker there and she was speaking, she came in to speak on virtuous women for Trump. Virtuous women for Trump. Wow. And I missed it, I had to leave them, but I heard it was good. Anyhow, in Judges chapter four, and the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. Well, that was happening a lot. When Ehud was dead, and the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazar, the captain of whose host was Sisera, which dwelt in Harath, Harasheth, <coughs> the Gentiles. 
And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron. In 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged Israel at that time. And she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah, between Ramah and Bethel and Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. And she sent out and called Barak, the son of Obinon, of Obinon, out of Kadesh. Naphtali, and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go, and draw toward Mount Habar, and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali, and of the children of Zebulon. And I will draw unto thee to the river of Kishon, and Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thine hand. Barak said unto her, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. Now he was the captain of the army, the military. And my guess is, is he wanted to make, to have her where he could keep an eye on her, okay? Because they knew that she was a prophetess. And, well, you know, in those days, like Jezebel and the other, uh, they had some very bad intentions for God's prophets. Mm. <clears throat> and she said, I, sh I will surely go with thee, notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor. For the Lord shall send Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went uh, with Barak to Kadesh. Well, that's exactly what happened. He sent Sisera in uh, into the hand of a woman. And she killed him. And then if you turn over, now that was, that was very good discernment, very wise discernment. Mm. And we turn over to uh, Job chapter 2. In the Job chapter 2, verses 6 through 10. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, Remember now, Satan's coming back for a second shot at Job. And uh, he's telling him, you know, you know, yeah, 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 I know. Uh, I took away all of his material things. You're right. Job's still, still an honorable man. He still kept his faith. But now, let me just touch his flesh. Let me take away his health and watch if he don't curse you to his face. But you see, God's in control of all of this. Uh, and Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. Now Satan, oh boy, he was, uh, he was talking about what he would do. That's what he would do. And so, but put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will cause thee to curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. He, he, you notice there, folks, that uh, Satan even has to be obedient to God. Mm. Even though he's at war with him, okay, he can, he's very limited to what he can do. And so went forth, so went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot into the, to his crown. Now, if you ever had those things, they are very, very painful. Very painful. And he took him a posture to scrape himself with all, and he sat down amongst the ashes. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thy integrity, curse God, and die? Mm. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What shall we receive? Good at the hand of God, and we shall not receive evil. Right. And all of this did not Job sin with his lips. We've been coming to you this morning from Doers of the Word Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Ernie Sanders, and the title of the message today was The Bible and Women Rulers. Uh, you can write us at Doers of the Word Baptist Church at 14781 Sperry Road in Newberry, Ohio, 44065. Or you can give us a call at 440-338-1367. You have been listening to us this morning on the Liberty Works Radio Network, the 
Eagle, 104, uh, 104 point, what is that? Uh, not, not on the Eagle anymore. Okay. Well, anyhow, uh, you may hear this programming played on Sundays, 2 a.m., 8 a.m., 2 p.m., and 8 p.m. Eastern Time. There. And until next week, we'll say good morning, God bless, and remember always, always, keep fighting the fight! All right. So, here now, that was very, very important to serve it, and as Job said, you're speaking as a foolish woman. What kind of ruler would she be, huh? And then turn to Proverbs chapter 28. In Proverbs chapter 28, Verse 2. For the transgressions, well, let me read verses 1 and 2. The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. That's one of the problems we have in this country. We don't have righteous people on the pulpits. No. The boldness isn't there. Mm. I remember back in the early 70s and the late 60s when this movement started through the evangelical church. And that was the, the pastors had to learn to be gentle. This was the movement that was coming in. And learn how, and you had these guys going around from church to church to teach the pastors how to become in touch with their feminine selves. You see, they tell them that we have a masculine part and a feminine, but we, we need to learn to, to get in touch with our feminine self. I was saying that then that is about as dumb as I can imagine then and it is now today. Amen? Amen. Amen. How many of you guys in here have ever gotten in touch with your feminine selves? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> He's liable to say anything. Okay. I am wondering about you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay. Uh, the transgression of a land, many are the princes, meaning legislators thereof. But by a man of understanding and knowledge, the state thereof shall be prolonged. By a man of understanding and knowledge. And turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. In the 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we read this starting... Uh, author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. This is God's law. This is, this is, and I remember this woman telling me, this Catholic lady telling me that the Apostle Paul was a male chauvinist. <laughs> the Apostle Paul was a male chauvinist. And uh, he says, And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. In a pool of pee. What come the word of God unto God out from you, or came it unto you only? For if any man think himself to be a prophet or a spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Amen. That the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Amen. You Amen. see, when I preach this Amen. message this week, I'm going to have a lot of women out there get angry with me. Oh, man. But their argument's not with me. It's right? with you. It's with the Word of God. God. <clears throat> and so, but if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. First Corinthians chapter 11. Starting with verse 1. Be followers of me, I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I deliver them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, Amen. and the head of the woman is the man, Amen. 
and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying and prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesies with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head. That is, even all one, as if she were shaven. What she's talking about there in those days, they had the Temple of Diana, and it went by several different names. But every young woman there in Corinth at the age of 18 had to go serve for two years as a prostitute in their temple. And you could tell them as prostitutes because they would, they would shave their heads like feminists do today. They would cut their hair real short, like men's haircuts, called short hair. And that's why one of the reasons when they came into the church in Corinth, Paul uh, said, cover your heads because, you know, in those churches, the men sit on one side and the women sit on the other. And when these women come in with the short hair, with the short hair, even if they had gotten saved, uh, the women in that church wanted to make sure that they didn't get anywhere near their husbands, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so this is why he was telling them one of the reasons why. But their, the komea, which means long hair, woman's hair, was given to her, okay, for a covering. See, <clears throat> in those days there, if you had, uh, if you were a free man, then you had your head uncovered. That everyone could see that you were a free man, especially the Romans. Hmm. If you were a servant or a slave, you had your head covered, meaning you were somebody's property. For the women there, it meant that that if you were to, to molest one of them, they had a, a, a either a husband or a father or a brother, somebody was going to uh, come and stand up for their honor. So, and that happened, these guys in the court, they were known uh, just like the same thing they called the, the Dagger Boys. Uh, when the Roman soldiers would have their way with the women at nighttime, they would be often be found with their throats slit, okay? And so that they would come after their, for her honor. And so he's saying, for every woman that prayeth or prophesies with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven, meaning a prostitute. By the way, today, did you see the new politically correct language? Now we're not calling prostitutes prostitutes anymore. I think it might have come in conflict with the federal judges, okay? Uh, because now they're calling prostitutes as sex workers. That's, what, that's, that's the new sex workers. That's what they're called now, sex workers, okay? <coughs> For if a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image of the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman is of the man. Meaning that God took, made Eve as a helpmate for Adam. Amen. And Eve came in. Now what he's talking about here, in their humanity, in their humanity, uh, the man, the woman, and child were all equal. And, and, and our humanity were equal. But God has given us a divine order, just like the same thing with the Trinity. In the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost are all equal in their divinity, but not in their divine order. Okay. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. But this caused off the woman to have power on, on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, Neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things to God. Judging yourselves, it is commonly that a woman praying to God and covered, is, that word commonly means is a proper. Does not even nature itself teach you that if, if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him, it means a dishonor. Folks, that's why all of these pic pictures that we have, all these pictures that we have, uh, where you see these, the Lord Jesus with his long hair, that's just some artist's perception. If you go back and you look at all of the busts, all of the statutes, the busts in those days, the men's hair were about like the way we men wear them today. Amen. About the same length. Again, mm -hmm. It wasn't. In those days, the only people that wore the long hair like that, males were were male prostitutes, whom mm -hmm. they called dogs, or uh, the barbarians, the German soldiers that 
uh, were recruited into as mercenaries into the Roman army. They had the long hair too, like that. And, and the Nazarites, yeah. For this cause, well, no, let me go back. Uh, but if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, <coughs> neither the churches of God. And then, I want you to go over to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And in 1 Timothy chapter 2, Verses 9 through 15. In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with a shaved face of this is sobriety, not with braided hair or gold, pearls, or costly array, but which becometh a woman professing godliness with good work. In other words, your beauty is supposed to come from within. Amen. Within. Amen. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith, charity, holiness, and sobriety. It doesn't mean he's not talking about eternal life salvation. He's talking about the childbearing means that the greatest ministry a woman can have would be to be a good wife to her husband and raise up children in the admonition of the Lord. Raise Amen. up children. And the ammunition of the war. <coughs> and, and then go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I want to read you verses 6 and 7. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Amen. Well, that is what you have today in the prosperity church out there. That's right. That's the prosperity church. <coughs> this is why if you watch it, Joe Olstein or Rick Warner, these guys, uh, these prosperity preachers, 80% of the, the people there are women. What? Mm -hmm. they, they don't understand the word of God. Okay? And boy, they they, they just fleece the flock all That's right. long. And then, I want you to go over to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Starting in verse 18. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write these things, saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. I know thy works in charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works. And the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, mm. which called yeah. herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed to idols. You see, uh, this woman Jezebel, it wasn't the same Jezebel in 1 Kings. It wasn't Ahab's wife. But mm. there was a woman, and they called her Jezebel, and she managed to get within the church and gain power in the church yeah. to become the pastor of That's the church. Right. Mm. And with that, she brought all of her, she seduced the people in the church. And this is what God said, I have a few things against thee. Get rid of her. Amen. Because he says, and I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. <laughs> Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and then they commit adultery with her into the great tribulation except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children in death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and the hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. God always does what he says he'll do. Uh, you can count on that. Now, I want to go to Isaiah chapter 3. In Isaiah chapter 3, I'm going to cut this down to just a few verses. Starting with verse 9. The show of their countenance doth witness against them, and they declare unto their sin as Sodom. They hide it not, woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Do you notice how many places in Scripture he keeps referring to the sin of Sodom? The sin of Sodom, the sin of Sodom. Mm -hmm. wow. 
Yeah. And that's exactly the two sins, the two things that God brought the greatest and the harshest judgment were for killing the children and for sodomy. And that's exactly what what liberalism is pushing, what, what this corrupted government that we have, what Hollywood, what NBC, ABC, CBS, what the public school system, that's exactly what they want to push on us, and push on us. Mm -hmm. Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. As for my people, children are their oppressors. Now, the word children here is used differently than it is uh, in verse 4. And I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. So he's, he's talking about two different things. One, the children here he's referring to are incompetent people. The kind of people we have in government today. Mm -hmm. Very incompetent people. And the other are adolescents, actual children here. Right. And down here he says, for my, for, as for my people, children are their oppressors, okay? And women rule over them. He's given them incompetent people and women as a punishment. Right. You see, God gives, let me read it again, for my people, as for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. God gives them incompetent people and women as rulers as a punishment. Amen. But this country is so stupid, they're asking God Boy, to punish hey. them. Yeah. They continue to ask God to punish them. Not, not just in this way, every different way. Right. And then, if you go to 1 Corinthians, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto the Christ, so let the wives be unto their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that he should be holy without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. So he's making two points there. Again, uh, wives, be obedient to your husbands. Obey your husbands and all things. Today, women don't want to do that. Sure don't. You've got that rebelliousness in there. And they want to they argue so often. Yeah. Okay. Now, remember, this is God's divine order, folks. It's His order. I'm the messenger here. Now, and I want to conclude with just one verse. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. For this cause also, thank we God, without ceasing, because you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in the truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you in that way. Amen. So he's telling you what he's telling you here. What you just heard, this message you just heard, was none of mine. It was all of it. It was the word of God. Amen. Amen. So if you have an argument with it, your argument's not with me. That's your right. argument's That's with God. God. <laughs> Nobody's won one yet. So. Amen. And with that, we're going to take up an offering. <coughs> and Ed, would you ask a blessing over the offering? Oh.